We'll be here in uh, Luke chapter 7, as we just read. And if you're with us and are in need of a Bible, you should find one in your pew in front of you. Luke chapter 7 is on page 1026 and 1027. Luke chapter 7, and again, we're focusing on verses 31 through 35. Luke 7, 31 through 35. Let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll begin in God's Word. Father in heaven, thank you for this time now that we focus on hearing from you in your Word. And I thank you for this rich passage of Scripture and Jesus' instruction to us here. Lord, I pray for your help to speak clearly as I ought to speak. I pray for our hearts and minds to be open to your words and to learn from them. I pray that they would penetrate to the depths of our hearts and our desires and our motives, and also, Lord, to bring us truth. Uh, we need the light of your truth, and we need it to be conformed to your image. And I pray that your spirit would do that work in us this morning and that we would be built up as a church. I thank you, Lord, for this time. And pray for your help and your spirit's help to speak is out to speak. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The title for this morning's message is The Folly of Jesus' Generation. The Folly of Jesus' Generation. The concept of a generation is important in the New Testament. Indeed, the Bible as a whole and also in contemporary America today. Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines the term as a group of individuals born and living contemporaneously. This is a generation. And as many of you know, generations have been further distinguished in American society by the bulk of people born within a certain time frame and are, who are of a certain age range. Right now, there are seven generations typically identified in America based on a person's time of birth, and each one of those generations comes with a set of sort of generalizations and characteristics which are based on cultural influences of the time, and I would say also the influences of their parents and the cultural influences that they experienced. So, for example, in America today, typically it's identified, these seven generations, the oldest would be the great generation or the greatest generation, those born from 1901 to 1927 who would have fought in World War II. After them, the silent generation, 1928 to 1945. And there are few in that generation because the Great Depression happened in the 30s and people were having less children because of the economic crisis. After them is the baby boomer generation, the children of the great generation. These were born after World War II and were teenagers and young adults during the social upheaval of the 1960s in America. After them, we have Generation X, and I would fall in the latter end, the very latter end of that category, me and Tim Frisch. We are children of the baby boomers, and we grew up in the 1980s and the 1990s. Then there are the millennials, very well-known generation of our time. I would probably fall into that category as well, although I wouldn't admit it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Someone said, ouch. They have been well distinguished and marked by various characteristics. And then we have Gen Z. Those would be my children in the time frame that they were born between 1996 and 2012. And now we have Gen Alpha, those born between 2013 and 2025. And indeed, even in our church, we have some of those and some who, who will sneak into that category very soon. <laughs> these are generations identified by the time that the, these people were born and also by the cultural influences on them as a whole. And of course, these terms and titles for American generations wouldn't necessarily 
carry over across international lines. Different countries uh, and, and groups of people born at different times have their own titles. It is legitimate, and I would say even biblically legitimate, to think in categories of generations. In fact, this theme is woven throughout the New Testament, and in particular, the consideration of the generations of Israel. There's a consideration of Israel and their generation today. There was a legitimate consideration of that in Jesus' day, which we'll see in a moment. And there always has been this very pertinent theme biblically down through redemptive history. And the reason is not because the biblical writers wanted to identify generations of Israel for uh, cultural nuances. The reason is because the nation as a whole, corporately, was in covenant with God. And nationally and corporately were called to live in covenant obedience with God dwelling in their midst. And what is traced throughout Scripture is the degree of faithfulness of the current generation and past generations or successive generations to that covenant. To a large degree, this is the main point and purpose of the general flow of the Old Testament historical narratives. You find the theme woven throughout the Torah and then on into the book of Judges and then Joshua, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. The main emphasis is how is Israel doing as a, genera- as a nation in these particular time frames relative to their covenant with God? And we see this theme biblically and even theologically very early in the Bible, just after the Exodus event, the, the main event in the Torah, the first five books, when the Israelites in the wilderness refuse to believe God's promises and enter the land. They refuse in unbelief, Numbers 13 and 14. Spies go into the land, some return with a good report, others return full of fear. And that influences the generation of Israelites, and they refuse to believe God and to follow Moses into the land. And we know this generation is significant because the judgment that ensues is they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years until that generation has died. And the next generation then enters the land under Joshua. And as we follow the storyline of Scripture, there were generations of chaos during the time of Judges, a generation of change for the better as the nation first followed Saul and then transitioned to David's leadership. And there was a generation of unbridled success and wealth under Solomon, which was followed by successive generations of division and ultimately of decline. There was a generation that faced the threat of Assyria and were taken captive by Assyria. There was a generation revived in Judah under Hezekiah, then a further generation revived under Josiah's leadership in Judah, and then also a generation of Daniel, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah that faced the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem and their captivity. And so this concept of a generation, and and specifically of Israel's generations, has been a legitimate and prominent theme throughout the scriptures. And this is still the case in the Gospels, during Jesus' day. We find this passage, one of the first occasions in Luke's gospel for Jesus to comment on this theme. It won't be his last. He will say more about his generation of Israelites, but this is really the first. Another example we can find later in Luke's gospel, if you turn over just a couple pages to Luke chapter 11, verse 29, Luke 11, verse 29, it says, As the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is a wicked generation. And again, he's speaking of Israel at the time. It seeks for a sign, yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah. Notice what he goes on to say. 
For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. This is referring to a previous generation, Solomon's. And behold, he says, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up if, from, from the time of uh, the book of Jonah and his generation. The men of Nineveh, not even Israelites, but Gentiles, will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, I, 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 I put this in my sermon and I almost started to write a different sermon because there are massive and important implications in this passage for how we ought to think about generations and especially even our generation today and our faithfulness to God. Massive implications. God, in some, to some degree, looks at the individual and someone's faith and their individual standing before God. But this passage tells me that to a, a, another degree, God also looks at generations, not just of Israelites, but also of Gentile nations and their faithfulness or their repentance or their tenderness to his word or his wisdom will be a feature in the final judgment as generations stand next to one another. We're getting to Luke 11. That will be a sermon for the near future. Please consider the implications of this passage for your generation, whether you are of the greatest generation or the silent generation or um, all those that come, the millennial generation, the Gen X generation. How will you fare? How will you fare in your time before God on earth? He goes on in Matthew 17 to call them a faithless and twisted generation. Matthew 23, he says to the generation of Israel at his time that they will have a mass of guilt heaped on them because they crucified Christ and persecuted his followers. Many other portions of the New Testament with this theme and on into the book of Acts, this consideration of Israel and their generation in Jesus' time. And Jesus here, like many of the prophets of the Old Testament, which were written by prophets with this perspective and gaze on Israel, Jesus here identifies and defines the Israel of his own generation, and in particular, the leaders. Notice how the passage for us this morning begins in verse 31. To what then shall I compare the people of this generation, and what are they like? And that question doesn't happen in a vacuum. If you remember the context from the last three weeks, we've looked at this passage, which begins regarding John the Baptist and his ministry. Jesus identifies him as the last and greatest Old Testament prophet, the greatest human of the Old Testament, in fact. Verse 28, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John. And John is also the representative of God's will for Israel at the time. Jesus points to this in verses 29 and 30. In Matthew's gospel, uh, his record of this same event and instruction, Jesus points to John as that messianic messenger Elijah prophesied in the book of Malachi, chapter 3 and 4. And finally, John's status now in prison indicates the status of the kingdom, that the kingdom of God advances forcefully through John's ministry and Jesus' ministry, uh, his miracles and his teaching, but at the same time is met with hostile opposition by violent men. And thus, John is in prison, and very soon Jesus will be crucified. That's how the passage uh, goes bef uh, before we get here today. But as part of his instruction on this occasion, Jesus also wants to define and describe his generation of Israel. And in particular, the influential and ruling leaders in Israel that had rejected John. And they will soon reject Jesus. And we see this as his point if we note verse 30. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. And then Jesus says, how shall I describe my generation? This morning, 
I'd like us to organize our thoughts about what Jesus says here under three questions. Number one, how does Jesus describe and define his generation, particularly the leaders? Number two, what about them spiritually or inwardly makes them like that? So we want to take a further step into thinking about what makes them like the way he's describing them. And number three, how can we, by, by application, avoid this in our own minds and hearts? We'll spend most of our time on the first question. Number one, how does Jesus describe and define the leaders of his generation? And the short answer to this is he describes them as foolish children. Notice what he says, to what shall I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. If we look at verse 31 there, there is one detail that proves important through uh, uh, the, 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 the understanding of this passage. In the ESV, it says, to what then shall I compare the people of this generation and what are they like? In the New American Standard, it's translated, to what then shall I compare the men of this generation and what are they like? The Greek term there is anthropos, which means men. At times, it could refer to just people generally, as the ESV takes it. But I think the New American Standard is good to convey the, the literal sense of the term here because the emphasis is on the leadership. But Jesus, in short, describes them as foolish children. Now, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> and certainly don't get Jesus wrong. Children are indeed a gift from God and a wonderful blessing from the Lord. During his ministry, Jesus made that very clear. When the children came to him in instinctively, the disciples tried to shun them from it, and Jesus said, let them come. He embraced them. He blessed them. We see that in Matthew 19, Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 18. And elsewhere, for parents, Psalm 127 Verse 3, it says, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. And I will take that promise to heart. But Scripture also teaches us, and our experience teaches us, and corroborates the truth of Scripture, that, is so, that there is something not so cute about children. You just have to visit Walmart on occasion, <laughs> and you'll see that to be true. Scripture also says in Proverbs 22, 15, folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. And I think this is the kind of folly that Jesus draws on and uses as an illustration to describe and define his generation, particularly the leaders. Now, this passage has three parts. <clears throat> the question, Jesus, Jesus asked, how shall I compare them? And the second part is an illustration and then its application to the, to the circumstance and the scene. And the third part is this final closing statement, which sort of puts the capstone on the passage. So the first part is a question. The second part is this illustration and application. Look at verse 32 through 34. He says, what shall I compare them? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not weep. Verse 33 now, the application for John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say he has a demon. And then verse 34, the son of man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now these three verses mark the heart of the passage, and I want us to take some time here. It's not difficult to imagine this scene. We've all watched children play and play in groups, play at recess with free time. And that's the scene here. Marketplace is an outdoor open forum with lots of adults uh, moving about, uh, uh, conducting their business, and perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps some children 
uh, somewhat unsupervised and friends and in a group in this wide open space playing their games. And here there are two that Jesus mentions. Some play the flute, instrument common in social gatherings at the time. Likely here it's a wedding party and procession that they have in mind because this flute playing occasions this kind of celebratory dancing. Some of the children take the initiative to decide, okay, we are going to pretend and play wedding. And they mimic the flute playing, as you can imagine, uh, with their hands and, and making the sound. And the others don't go along with it, and they do not dance. So those pretending to play wedding change, and they instead begin to pretend to play funeral, and they begin to sing a dirge, which is a, a, a song for a funeral occasion with a kind of minor tone and a mourning style. And as they sing, other children still refuse to play along and mourn with them and weep and follow along with pretending. Now, just to nuance this scene a bit, Jesus' language is fairly general. And this is important for the interpretation. He could mean that there is one group of children who are the initiators, and they initiate both the pretend game of wedding and the pretend game of funeral, while the other sort of portion of the group doesn't respond to either game. Or he could mean that there is one group who is insisting on a wedding and the other group dancing, but the other group of children is insisting on, no, no, let's play funeral and you guys will mourn while we sing the dirge. His, his words are fairly general. Notice again the details in verse 32. They are like children, plural, sitting in the marketplace, generally, and calling to one another. The, the term there is very specific, reflexive pronoun, calling to one another. We played the flute and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you didn't weep. Really, it could be either scenario. In Matthew's gospel, there's this added detail that I think helps a bit. He uses a different term there. What shall I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates, it has in the ESV. Uh, literally, it has another word for others, calling to the others. So it seems to me that this picture conveys generally this large group of children who are sort of naturally divided into two groups. And I think it's the one group making the uh, demands and kind of initiating what is going to be played and sort of setting the rules while the other group folds their arms and refuses to go along with, with either idea. Now, the image is not that difficult to understand. This is a common scene. We can, I don't think the Lord is reducing this down to two options of pretend because that's the most significant part. We can think of all kinds of ways that children play like this. The challenge in this passage is how does this picture then correspond to what Jesus goes on to say about himself and John the Baptist? Notice verse 33. It says four. It begins with four. And he goes on to explain how this picture is relevant then to his ministry and John the Baptist's ministry. Now, there's three views about this that I think are worth summarizing, all right? So please, uh, if you have a Bible, keep it open here, and it's going to require us to think through a little bit the, the, the possibilities and options of the connection between the picture and Jesus' explanation of the picture. Now, the first view sees a correspondence really between the two initiators of the games mentioned above, or the two, two versions of games Jesus gives, and then the two ministers that he mentions in verses 33 and 34, he and John the Baptist. In other words, this view would go something like this. Jesus sort of flutes the tune of grace and salvation worthy of a celebratory kind of response like dance at a wedding. Jesus has good news to give. Just like at a wedding, we play a song with a flute that encourages celebratory dancing. Well, on the other hand, John sings the dirge of impending judgment and radical repentance worthy of a mourner's response. 
In both cases, there is a lack of response by the other children, and this would be the indictment on his generation. What's wrong, in other words, with Jesus' generation is that he came proclaiming good news, John claimed proclaiming judgment, and it was met with an indifferent and hard-hearted response by their generation. In this case, in this view, Jesus would be putting himself and John among those children of the scene, very specific and particularly the ones who either started the flute playing or the one who started the, the dirge. Now, there's a true principle there about how they were received by the majority of their generation. It, they were rejected. And so I think that is true, but I don't think that is Jesus's meaning here. And indeed, I think it cannot be the meaning because this illustration is, is crafted by the Lord with him looking at his generation. And he encourages his listeners and the readers of Luke's gospel to view the generation by this scene as a whole. It wouldn't make a whole lot of sense for he and John the Baptist to be included in these foolish children. He looks on it. <clears throat> the second view sees the opposite, that the leaders of the games are the Pharisees and legal experts who he had mentioned in verse 30. The Pharisees and the scribes, or the Pharisees and the lawyers. And they are the ones who play the flute and who sing the dirge. And they themselves take the mantle of leading in their generation, and they want Jesus and John to sort of dance to their tune. They want and expect them to conform to their own idea of what makes respectable religion within their established framework of Israel. Let me quote a couple commentators on this. One says, like spoiled brats who accuse their playmates of being spoil sports because they will not do their bidding, they condemn John and Jesus for their refusal to defer to their wishes. Another one says, it's a picture of the Jews who tell the ascetic John to dance and the joyful Jesus to mourn, which is, which is very insightful. They don't like John's ministry, and the, so they say he's too ascetic, he's too extreme, he should be a little more lighthearted. And then for Jesus, who celebrates and eats and drinks with sinners, they say, well, well that's too, too happy, you should be rather mourning. And they have criticism either way. Neither John nor Jesus, he goes on, will satisfy them. It is the Jews who are dissatisfied both with the ascetic John and the joyful Jesus. And I think that is much closer, but still missing an element. Remember, in <clears throat> earlier in verse, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 32, as he makes this comparison, he says, they are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. Within the generation, there are children calling to one another. And so the third view understands Jesus' description and indictment of his generation to include both those who are calling the shots, we played the flute, we sang a dirge, and also the, the other portion of this group of children who respond with a refusal to go along with what's being pretended. Here's again what one writer says. Jesus intends for the parable to present both the active and passive children as disagreeable. The one group wants to choose and control the game. The other refuses to join in any game. And he says the children's play is paralyzed by their individual selfishness and ill-natured insistence on having their way. Another writer agrees. Rather, the Jewish leadership is complaining that John and Jesus do not follow their desires. From the leader's perspective, God's messengers are at fault for not listening to them. The leaders do not wish to enter the game unless it is played according to their rules. I think that's the right view. He goes on, this generation is like children who will play only if they can make the rules. It is the desire of the leaders to dictate and not to listen to God's 
messengers. In other words, the two games mentioned has a relevance to the situation because it describes polar opposites of the spectrum of games, right? One is a wedding and there's cheerful dancing. The other is a game of, of mourning and a funeral. And that's important, but it's not the most important feature of the picture. What's most important is what, what is common to them both. Namely, we played the flute, you didn't dance. We sang a dirge, you didn't mourn. In other words, we're okay with playing anything, even if they're opposites, just so long as, that, as you do what we want and we can make up the rules and we are not going to play unless we get to do that. Now, isn't that the folly of children when you watch them play? I, mean, I don't think the specific examples of games here are what the Lord has primarily in mind. It's not the content of the games, but their insistence on leading and having everyone else follow suit and making sure that they can have that position or else they're not going to play. I mean, I've seen this tons of times with kids when they play together. I remember what this was like. When I was young, I had a twin, I have a twin sister, and in the 80s, we wanted to play Star Wars, right? And this was somewhere around 1984, so it was the good Star Wars. And of course, with a twin sister, who was I supposed to pretend to be? Come on, Luke, right? This is easy. This fits even with my family, right? But I had this neighbor named Gino, and Gino would not have it because he wanted Luke's lightsaber and not the gun, right? Han Solo had the gun, and that is just boring, right? So Gino is not going to play unless he can be Luke, and I'm not going to play unless I... Oh, thanks, thanks. Thank you. I'm not going to play unless... Excuse me. Unless I can be Luke. Now, Gino was bigger than me and a little older, so Gino eventually got to play Luke, even though it was totally contrary to sound logic. <laughs> <laughs> so I would refuse to play, then he would refuse to play, and then we'd do something else like go look for salamanders or something. And so I think what Jesus has in mind here is deeper than the content of the games being pretended, even though that is a relevant detail to the uh, illustration. It is the trend, rather, the folly of children that I think he's drawing on is this trend for children to make up the rules of the game as they go. Have you ever seen that? And if the pretend game begins to shift in favor of another child, of being in the position of winning or leading or calling the shots, then there is this tendency to adjust the rules altogether or to just choose a different game so that they can maintain their position in the whole, in the whole business. Maybe a simple example of this is like if you're playing tag and you're about to get tagged and you, you go, you're close to a rock and you say, oh, this is base, <laughs> right? because you don't want to get tagged. Children do this kind of thing all the time, and it's funnier with how creative they get to manipulate the rules and the games just to maintain that position. I think they do this all the time. And so in the illustration, it is, we played this flute. There is a determination of that group of children to decide what the game is, what they're going to do, and have the position in the pretend, and then also what the other people are supposed to do to follow them. And then when they don't, they switch the game, still maintaining that position and expecting the others to follow suit, which they don't. And I think both sides of the group illustrate the same tendency to want to be at the center, to want to lead, to want to win, and therefore to render criticism and judgment on those who don't fall in line. There's an innate demand with this folly bound up in the heart of the child, which has its root in selfishness and pride. 
It's a demand. It is, it is the, the, the ultimate rule of the game that I am the rule maker and that I will be at the center of controlling what happens here. Everyone else involved will have to, will have to follow my lead and inevitably I'm going to be the winner or else I'm not playing. Jesus, I think, uses this to describe the men of his generation, in particular, the leaders that are there in front of him that have rejected John. And their heart says something like this. We've determined that we are the leaders here in Israel. And we can, we can flex this game to some extent from one extreme to the other. It doesn't matter. What's fixed is me calling the shots. And I will therefore, or we will therefore, determine what you and everyone else must do. And when you don't do what we want, we will criticize you for it. I think this is exactly what Jesus is highlighting here about this generation of leaders because of what he says next about their appraisal of John the Baptist and him. Notice how this carries through in their criticism in verse 33. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. In other words, John's very aesthetic, I'm sorry, aesthetic lifestyle and extreme sort of demands in his message for thoroughgoing repentance were just too extreme for them. And at the same time, as John was gaining in popularity, John challenged their own hypocrisy, their own complacency, their own pride as the Pharisees and the lawyers and sort of the, the social religious leaders of the day. And he warned them when they came to him. He, he, he called them a brood of vipers. And he said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Don't suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our fathers. That was a point of pride for them in their status. Instead, John claimed them, you need repentance just as much as any other Israelite and indeed, just as much as any other Gentile, and that is why we're doing baptism with full immersion. He didn't dance to their tune. He didn't acquiesce to the demands of their leadership. He preached as sent from God with a disregard for their structure of leadership and status that they had in Israel. And so they found a superficial reason to criticize and then dismiss him. Their criticism was that he came neither eating nor drinking. He's eating grasshoppers and he's eating wild honey out in the wilderness alone, outside of the social norms. And so they criticize him for that. And they go so far as to say it's because he's crazy, because he has a demon. John was a legitimate prophet from God. And there had not been one in 400 years. And on top of that, John's ministry is bearing legitimate and good results in Israel because hard-hearted Israelites are coming to him with tender hearts for God, repenting of their sin, confessing their sin, and wanting to be right with God. And it's happening all around them. And instead they say, no, no. He is not dancing to our tune. He is not going along with what we've established as far as leadership in Israel. And so even though he's having this influence and it's supernatural and legitimate, it's because he's demon possessed. We can't bear the thought of legitimizing someone outside of our rules. And so instead, we'll claim he has a demon. They do this to Jesus uh, soon as well. Notice also the criticism they, they bring to Jesus. It's very similar. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, what exposes the folly of their hearts and the folly of their approach? Jesus highlights here in the two extremes, right? John came neither eating nor drinking, and you say he has a demon. The Son of Man, referring to himself, has come eating and drinking. And you, you level an equal kind of criticism to dismiss him. You say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. 
another superficial criticism of Jesus' ministry just because he is not going along with their systems of leadership and people are coming to him in absolute droves. Notice in that criticism of Christ, it completely overlooks everything that has been happening in his ministry. There's no mention of his miracles. There's no mention of the content of his teaching. There's no mention of his own life and ethics. No mention of his compassion. No mention of his mercy. It is just superficial. But in the end game, they dismiss him entirely and say he's irrelevant. Well, what's motivating them to do that? It's just to maintain their status. It's just to maintain that they're at the top of the religious food chain. He's eating, he's drinking, associating with low life, so to speak. That's not righteous, you're dismissed. The bottom line of these very divergent criticisms is, look, we're in charge. If you don't play by our rules, you're dismissed and criticized. We must, at the end of the day, ultimately maintain our position as the center and leader of the religious life of Israel. And John and Jesus just challenged the daylights out of that because people listen to their message. The Pharisees and the lawyers rejected them. Jesus, uh, Luke says in verse 30, but many people, tax collectors and sinners who knew their need for grace and forgiveness responded. They came to John to be baptized, and then they came to Jesus to be forgiven. And I think that the context here in Luke chapter 7 and in Matthew's version in Matthew 11 absolutely reinforces those scenes. Just consider what is next in Luke chapter 7 is that we have a perfect example of Jesus indeed being a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In, in their criticism, and in the Lord's words in verse 34, there is this, 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 this sense of um, irony in that they would criticize him for that. And all the while, the reality of Jesus being a friend of tax collectors and sinners is the absolute heart of the gospel. And we see it totally on full display in the very next scene with Jesus at a Pharisee's house and then a sinful woman comes in to him, broken and contrite and in desperate need of forgiveness. And this friend of tax collectors and sinners stands up for her and also assures her of her absolute forgiveness. This is what comes next. But there is still this Pharisee who is rendering this criticism of both the woman and Jesus along the way. Look at verse 39 of chapter 7. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man, referring to Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. You know, the perspective of the gospel is that this is a good thing. The perspective of a Pharisee is, this is a bad thing, according to my rules, according to my position of judgment on the whole thing. How does Jesus come at this woman? And as a friend of tax collectors and sinners, how does he come at them? With compassion. With compassion. Jesus came as a savior in his first coming. Because of God's great love, his judgment for sin, which will come in the last day, has been suspended so that he can offer his love and grace and compassion to sinners like you and I. Indeed, Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. This is not a criticism. This is the heart of the gospel. We're running out of time. What about them? I want to ask, and we'll close with this, what about this generation and the leaders of this generation spiritually or inwardly made them like this? The answer is very simply pride, religious pride. Their religious pride had given rise to them assuming this position in Israel to themselves. Very similar to a child 
who in a, in a context of playing games with others, assumes to them a position of leading the game or else they won't play, won't play. And assuming this position so that others will fall in line to their demands. This pride has given rise also to them assuming that their sort of structure and the relative um, credence they give to other rabbis and other rabbinic schools is also this, the rules of the game and the standard by which all the work of God can be affirmed or else denied. They're in a position that they feel they should be the adjudicators of whether John's ministry is legitimate or Jesus's ministry is legitimate. And that's pride. In fact, this is so much part of their hearts and minds that they would reject John as demonized and even reject their Messiah in the face of his undeniable miracles. And this is a theme that goes on all throughout the New Testament. In Luke 11, Jesus catches the criticism. He's casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. People marveled. Wouldn't you? But some of them said he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons. We haven't legitimized his ministry. It can't be from God. It has to be from the devil. And they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We see another example in John chapter 9 when Jesus heals a man who had been born blind. And the Pharisees want to dismiss that as not a genuine miracle, that something else must have happened. They go to corroborate with the man's parents uh, and, and corroborate, how, was he really born blind? And they say, yes, he was. And they say, well, how does he see? They say, we don't know because they're afraid. They go back to the man and they, 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 they ask him, how do you now see? And he's like, I told you already. This, this guy came and he healed me. And they ask, where is he from? And he says, this is a peculiar thing. No one has ever been healed from being born blind. And you ask me, where is he from? And this goes on to a further um, conflict between Jesus and them where he highlights this aspect of their religious pride. Notice John 9, 39. Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see, literally and spiritually. And those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Their, their blindness is worse than the blindness of the man he healed. It's worse than the average Israelite. It's worse because it's compounded by the delusion that they see. That they're the leaders. That they can reject God's genuine messengers, namely John the Baptist and his own son, Jesus Christ, because of their vantage point, with their, their, their perspective, that will render the final verdict on whether Jesus and John's ministries are legitimate. It's pride. It's selfishness and pride that fuels children to make up rules of the game and expect everyone else to follow their orders. And we laugh at that, and it's funny because we know these are children doing this instinctively, very superficially, and also it can never work, right? If every child demands that, they don't get to really play, right? We know that as adults, and yet there's still this tendency from pride and even religious pride to come at the world, to come at ministries this way, and it's highlighted here in the Pharisees and the lawyers. I want us to consider how we can avoid this in our own minds and hearts, but perhaps we'll save that for next week. I think there are certain things and uh, certain themes in the New Testament that would would warn us about this attitude and also certain ways and practices that, that we can adopt within evangelical Christianity to take on this similar kind of mindset. And we'll pause there and resume next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage and for your insights into the nature of our hearts, Lord. I pray that you would continue to instruct us from this insightful illustration and also that as a church, uh, we would put off pride and especially religious pride in adopting these kinds of mindsets. 
Lord, we need to be discerning of ministries and ministers out there, of teachers. But Lord, we are not at the center, and we do not make up the rules of the game. You are at the center. You are the adjudicator. You are the final judge. Help us, Lord, to have this balance, and I pray that uh, we would apply these truths to our lives and think of the implications this week. In Jesus' name, amen.